It's September 2000. We're in Sydney, Australia because the Olympics have begun. Olympic wrestling is like our Super Bowl, Tour de France, World Cup, all rolled into one. It's the biggest stage that a wrestler can compete on. Here's Brandon's high school coach, Johnny Cobb. You know, the entire world is focused on that Olympic Games. And uh, like I said, any wrestler who has an Olympic dream and actually gets there, just to make the team to be there, I mean, how can it be any better than that in the toughest sport on the planet? That year, the Olympics featured one of the best wrestlers that's ever walked the planet. And I'm not talking about Alexander Karelin, folks. I'm talking about the great Bovisar Satyev. Satyev, the great Satyev of Russia in the blue. When we last heard from Satyev, back in episode two, he had just won the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta as a 21-year-old phenom. But after that, the legend of Satyev only grew as he won the world championships in 97 and 98. Heading into 2000, Satyev hadn't lost a match in over six years. Since 94, I hadn't lost a single match. I won every world and European tournaments and the 96 Olympics. That means that Satyev was the pound-for-pound best wrestler in the world. But in 1999, he disappeared off the circuit and declined his spot on Team Russia. So he took a year off to give his brother a spot, and his brother was the world champion. And so I think Buvasa was like, hey, you know, go, you go make the team and you win, and Adam did. When you're so confident in your skills that you let someone else wrestle in your place, that's a level of dominance that very few people can understand. But in 2000, Bovisar returned to the lineup at 76 kgs and was heading to the Olympics as the prohibitive favorite. Brandon Slay's chances of Olympic gold would hinge on one question. Could he beat the great Bovisar Satyev? Welcome to episode four of Slaying Satyev. Now, Brandon Slay and the rest of Team USA arrived in Sydney for the Olympics about three weeks before wrestling began. When they got there, they drove three hours north for an acclimation camp and began final preparations. Meanwhile, Brandon's friends and family began filtering into Sydney. We landed, we pulled in, we was flying into Sydney and it was during the day and, and you looked out there and you see this big island, beautiful blue ocean coming down into it, the sandy beaches. It was just, it was neat. It was just, I mean, you just got chill bumps. That's Brandon's dad, Doug Slay, who was arriving in Australia for the very first time. You just didn't know what to expect when you go there. You were just in awe of the, the bigness of it, the enjoyment of it. It was a, just a, it was like opening up a big Christmas package in one morning, you know, and bam. I don't know if we could ever recreate that again. That's just one of those one-time deals. Brandon Slay's childhood friend, Browner, had also made the trip. And one of the, the most exciting, best memories I have, and I think it was probably two or three in the morning when we got settled into our house and we wanted to go. And I'll never forget, we went out, and the next morning the sun was starting to come up and steam, with the, the people were out there doing the uh, rowing, and steam was coming up. You know, it's like the whole village, like the, the Olympic stadium, everything was coming alive. I thought, man, this is amazing. As Brandon's friends and family were taking in the sights that only an Olympic village can provide, Brandon was about to begin the battle before the battle, the weight cut. It was Wednesday, September 27th, the same day that Rulon took out Corellin. But before all that went down, the freestyle wrestlers were to make weight, including Brandon Slay, who was standing in his townhouse checking his weight. So I got on the scale around, I think around 10. And I remember looking at it, I knew it was a high number. And then John Smith, uh, he, he, he came over. He was one of our three Olympic coaches at the time. And they had him focused on me for the weight cut. And I think just because we kind of speak slow, we kind of speak the same language a little bit. I think that they thought 
John would be good for me because they knew I was going to have a pretty solid weight cut. So he walks me back over. He wanted to see the number. So I get on, he looks at the number, and I think he was kind of like, was like, well, we better get started then now, shouldn't we? Brandon Slay was ten and a half over, with just a few hours until weigh-ins. And so it began, folks. One of the most miserable experiences you could ever endure. I started my process where I get I get in the sauna, it's hot, you know, I put baby all over me, I put my shorts, my t-shirt on, I'm starting to sweat, I put my plastics on, which by the way, they're in the sauna, so they're starting to get hot, they're warm now too. And this was the system, and then I, my system, then I put my sauna suit top on, and then immediately, because it's so hot, you put your sweatshirt on first, right? And then you put your sweatpants on, that way you can pull your sweatpants big, like over the top, you can tuck your sweatshirt in, right? Then you put your um, toboggan hat on, you get your Sony Discman going, you get your tunes going, so that's playing. Okay, so I'm now listening to my music, I start sweating, making sure you kind of see some sweat starting to group down at the bottom of your sweatshirt right there. You kind of check your pants to make sure some sweat's hitting the bottom of your sweats, like you know you're sweating really good. And then I would follow a system when I would go ride the stationary bike on zero resistance, really important, not five, zero, just to keep my body heat up. I'd ride for 30 minutes, then I'd go back and get in a sauna for five more minutes. That'd come out, that's 35 minutes. And I'd go ride for 20 minutes. After an hour of this hellish routine, Brandon Slay was ready for a break. So I remember telling John, like, hey, I want to take my plastics off. I've dealt with this with wrestlers before, too. Like, hey, coach, I want to take my plastics off. I just, I just, because I just want to check. I just want to check. Right? And this is where John Smith was really important. And he's like, you're not taking your damn plastics off. If you're 10 and a half over, you told me you normally lose seven and eight pounds. You didn't lose 10 and a half pounds then. Right? I'm like, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I keep I keep my plastics on. So I want to take him off. And he's like, nope. You know, you're going to go another two more rounds on the bike. So I'm like, 30 and then 20? He's like, no, you'll just do, you'll do 10s and 5s, 10s and 5s. So then I do another 10 on the bike and 5 in the sauna. 10 on the bike, 5 in the sauna. Um, and then I want to take him off again. He's like, no. Are you starting to break at this point? I'm starting to get um, very uncomfortable. Um, Hot, very uncomfortable. But I would tell you, I had so much respect for John Smith, Mm -hmm. as most wrestlers do. I had so much respect for him. I had so much respect that he was with me one-on-one on on the day I'm making weight at the Olympic Games, there right by my side, that I was going to do whatever he encouraged me to do. And I think because John Smith was there, I didn't. I wanted to make, I wanted to make him proud. I wanted to let him know that, hey, I'm from Amarillo, Texas, right down the road from Dell City, Oklahoma, and we're, you know, we're, we're tough. And so I kept him on. I kept pushing through it. And eventually, I had him on for about. We went over to the two hour mark. We started getting this about the two hour, two fifteen mark, and finally he was like, "All right, you know, you can take him off." As Slay peeled the plastics off. He looked at John Smith for his next instruction. So I took all my plastics off, and then he wouldn't let me check. So then we started doing. Then we started doing um, five minute goes in the sauna. So I think I think we did about four five minute goes in the sauna when he was in there with me. So I finished that strong, and finally, after all those goes, he let me um, he let me go check my weight, and I weighed like one sixty seven point seven. I was only point two over. I lo- I lost like ten point three pounds. During that go. With Brandon's weight under control, he and John Smith headed to the arena, walked into the weigh-in room, and made weight. And then, out of the corner of Brandon's eye, he saw a bearded man with black hair sitting against the wall. It was Satiev. I, I saw him in the weigh-ins. He was kind of sitting back. Like, I think he, it's interesting. He was almost like one to like look at all the guys that were going to weigh in. Um, cause back then they didn't necessarily call your number or whatever. I mean, you just got in line. So I think he was kind of setting backs like, you know, who's going to be in this bracket. So I kept watching him and he wasn't, he wasn't getting up to, to make weight. And he actually ends up looking at me. We make eye contact. And I think he thought Joe Williams was going to be the representative. I just, I think that's what he thought. Cause when he looked at me, his eyes kind of like, he raised his eyebrow a little bit and like, Oh, you're the American. Like, I don't know who you are. He would soon enough folks. Because during that day, there was one other bit of drama. It unfolded in a small conference room right after the weigh-in. I'm speaking, of course, of the draw. 
The Olympic Bracket Draw. It's like the Powerball drawings you see on TV, only instead of lottery numbers, someone is drawing little medallions which contain numbers, and those numbers determine the matchups for the Olympics' first stage, the pool rounds. We don't use pools anymore, but back in 2000, the Olympic field was divided into eight pools of three, with the winner of each pool advancing to a single elimination bracket. To have a shot at meddling, you had to win your pool. And if you don't win your pool, you're out of the tournament. No medal, nothing. No medal, no anything. You have to win your pool to advance. And one by one, wrestlers would walk up, pull a number, and they would be drawn into a pool. Finally, it was time for Brandon to draw. We go back in this area where there's a projector, not this nice digital screen like we have now. I reach inside the bag. I'm pretty sure I pulled out the number two, and it was a really nice medallion. It's the Olympic Games, right? So you pull out a medallion, and then on the back it has the number two in it. And so I knew I was going to be the number two, two in the bracket. And then we start w- watching for, like, well, who's going to be the number three guy? And all of a sudden it starts filling in, you know, the number 10 guys in there, the number eight guys in there. And we're like, well, who's going to be that third guy in my pool? And all of a sudden it goes boom. And I'm pretty sure it's that number three guy said R-U-S. So then I know like Satyev and I are in the same pool. Satyev in your pool? Well, it's the worst possible draw. Especially since Brandon now had to beat the Russian to have any shot at meddling. Word of the draw traveled fast. First to Brandon's college coach, Roger Reyna, who was sitting at a cafe in Sydney when he heard the news. Initial thoughts when you heard Satya was in Brandon's pool? Um, we wanted him early or late. So, got him early. And it was kind of a gulp, but that is what we wanted. Um, either early, because Brandon's first senior level world or Olympic games. And we thought better, you know, better to catch him in the finals or better to catch him right out of the chute. But there was still a gulp. It's kind of like, okay, we're, we're going to get this on soon. Roger Reyna wasn't the only one who heard about the draw. Shortly after, Brandon's childhood friend Browner, who was taking in a few cocktails on Bondi Beach, received a text on his flip phone. When I first heard who Slay, who was in Slay's pool, I mean, I, I get goosebumps. Now I think, I'm thinking in my head, God, man, that sucks. And so um, I, I started, I had to tell myself that, hey, he's good. Hey, he's, he's ready for this. And after that, I, I was so nervous and, he should have been nervous because Bovisar Satyev was in the peak of his prime and it was all but assumed that he would win a second gold medal. Whereas Slay, he was an unknown, wrestling in his first world and Olympic competition. What did you guys know about Brandon Slay before the Olympics? I don't know much. He just uh, a guy from US which nobody knows. That's Sergei Belaglasov again. In 2000, he was one of the coaches for the Russian Olympic wrestling team. What so, about Satya? Was he predicted to win? Yes, I think uh, Russian, uh, they already count this. So it's additional pressure. So they expect from you gold medal. I asked Sergey what Satya's game plan was for Brandon Slay. The plan was, you know, we, we, when Satya wants to wrestle scramble with him because we, we know if it will be technical, Satya better. We know this. And you better believe, folks, that Brandon Slay wanted nothing to do with Satya scrambling, where he was the best in the world when someone was in on his legs. But despite Satya's dominance in basically every position in wrestling, he did have one weakness. All the times I saw Satya get taken down, it was typically from a double leg. And every once in a while, the times that I did see him get turned, it was from a gut wrench. So as I watched the video, I realized, well, this is great because my number one move on my feet is a double leg. This is great. My number one move on the mat is a gut wrench. So that gave me a lot of confidence against him. Could Slay exploit those weaknesses? Let's find out. Because in less than 24 hours, Brandon and Satyev were set to wrestle. The next day at 5.30 p.m., Brandon, Kevin Jackson, and the U.S. delegation arrived at the Sydney Convention Center. He walked into the warm-up area, sat against the wall, and began lacing up his ASICs. He had just 90 minutes 
until the match with Satiev. As Brandon was getting his warm-up started, he looked to his left and saw Satiev in the distance. Well, I remember seeing him in the warm-up just thinking, you know, this is this guy. Like, he's just, guy so skinny. Like, I remember thinking, it's like, I remember thinking, I mean, do they have protein in Russia? You know, it's like this guy. But then, I mean, clearly this guy beats everybody, so he has a certain skill set. Two stories above the warm-up area, fans were filtering into the arena, which was shaped like a rectangle. And on the long sides, you had bleachers with flags from every possible country hanging overhead. In the center was a big blue platform with three yellow and red mats. The Sydney 2000 logo and the Olympic rings were everywhere. Brandon's high school coach, Johnny Cobb, found his seat. And I said, well... The butterflies I got could take me back without an airplane to Amarillo, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was just like, you know, goosebumps. As Johnny Cobb was getting settled, Kerry Bowman's, Brandon's roommate at the training center, found his seat as well. He noticed that most of the fans were still talking about the rule on upset that had happened just 24 hours prior and were paying little attention to the 74 kg pool finals between Satiev and Slay. Oh, everybody's thinking Satiev is going to win. Cause I, I think there was only a couple Americans around me. I mean, it was all foreigners that were around me, really. And uh, they were like, "He's not going to win. He's not going to win." I said, "You watch. You watch. Mark my words." Back in the warm-up area, with just five minutes until match time. Satiev and Slay were standing next to each other in the tunnel. Kevin Jackson, Brandon's coach, noticed that Slay was a little bit nervous. But we're in the tunnel and Satiev is, is standing right next to us. And, um, and he's getting ready, to, he's getting warmed up. And I could tell he was a little bit nervous. You know, he was a little bit apprehensive and he wasn't like, I'm, I'm, re- I'm ready to go out here and, and get this thing done. And I said, let's take a look at this guy. He's skinny. And you're stronger than him. You're more explosive than him. And that's I drew a lot of confidence for my power and being explosive and blowing through guys and being able to lock up gut wrenches and explode through guys. So I think if he sensed any any um, nervousness in me, I think he was just just a wise coach at that moment to remind me. So kind of, you know, from a joking standpoint, getting him to smile, getting him to laugh, you know, Brandon's looking at the TF like the TF understands what I'm saying, but he, I don't think he did, even though he speaks pretty good English. Um, but Sati- but I think, I think Brandon was more worried about the TF hearing me talk to him that way but it but it but I think it changed his mindset a little bit and it refocused him but I think at that moment what Kevin Jackson shared with me was just kind of like closing um, just just closing bits of encouragement just to spike you know to spike my confidence before I walked out there moments later Slay and Satya have emerged from the tunnel and began walking to the mat Johnny Cobb Brandon's high school coach was now standing on his feet waving an American flag. I wave that red, white, and blue <laughs> every chance I get. And I'm just so proud of this country. And I always envision me, I dream, you know, standing on the Olympic gold medal award stand, watching that flag go up and play that national anthem, you know. Oh, my God, what greater thrill could there possibly be ever, you know. So watching him just go- walk out there as re- representatives of the United States just being there and every time he walked out there I mean you know just one of those things man I said damn they're representing the United States of America right there's my man Mr. Brandon Slay from Tascosa High School in Amarillo Texas (laughs) you know (laughs) hey here he is as Slay walked to the mat coaches Kevin Jackson and Bruce Burnett followed close behind like three brothers heading into war I remember the walkout just being really thankful that that KJ was with me in my corner. He'd been with me for two years, but not only him, Bruce Burnett, who I'd known since 1990. So at that moment, freestyle wrestling, Olympics, at that moment, those were the two guys um, that I wanted in my corner, you know, and I had them. With both wrestlers on the mat, Satiev on the left, Slay on the right, there was just seconds until the match started. I wasn't nervous or scared. It was more just like, I would say I was just excited. I've been thinking about this since 1995, 1996, and now the moment is here. 
I knew I had to make the Olympic team to get to this moment. I made it. Now he's in my pool. I'm going to have to beat him and win the gold medal. And so it's time to walk out there on the mat. And uh, I was ready. Brandon Slay in the blue. Satiev in the red. He is the Olympic champion in this weight division. This match all important. We're in the pool. Preliminary rounds. You must win your pool to get into the quarterfinals. And Slay has drawn... The Russian the world champion into his pool. He's got to win this to get out. As the match started, Satiev barely moved. As Slay circled and faked. I start kind of punching the guy's shoulder. I start faking him. I want I want to see how he reacts to that. If he's going to start bobbing and weaving and coming up, then I know that there could be a window of opportunity for me to shoot. With 15 seconds gone, Slay had jabbed Satiev five times without the Russian so much as flinching. But on the sixth jab... Satiev reached. And I don't care if you're Satiev or you're a four-time NCAA champ or you're a little kid that started wrestling last week. It's just so tempting. When you go to reach for a guy with your hands, it's so tempting for that guy to want to reach for you. Lo and behold, his hands come up, rise his hands come up. You know, I didn't even think about it. I've done this so many times, drilling. It was just instinctive. I level changed and I just, I shot to kill. I, I hit a double leg as hard as I could. He, he kind of slid off a little bit. I didn't knock him off his feet. And so then I had to come around behind him and I had to basically kind of knee him. I went to kind of knee him up the rear, but my other knee came forward. I kind of kneed him in the face, which is all good. Um, broke him down. To the shock of the audience, Slay took down Satiev and now had a 1-0 lead. Kerry Bowmans was on his feet. I was in the stands and I saw him change his levels and hit that double. And I was like, oh, He's, he took, I said, he's going to take him down. He took him down. I said, and I knew Brandon had a, just a nasty gut wrench. Mean, just hard, hardcore gut wrench. And as soon as he took him down, he went for it. Got a tight uh, gut wrench lock, which that was the plan too. I've, I've visualized gut wrenching him thousands of times. I get the gut wrench locked. Um, I start driving. I pop my hips as hard as I can. I mean, I went nuts in the stand. I mean, there was people in front of Russians in front. I was like, yeah, waving the flag. I was like, I turn him, which seemed really easy, thinking back on it, but then all of a sudden, he catches my wrist. Now it's not easy anymore because I can't get my arm out. And then he starts going to reverse me, and if and if I don't bail right here, then he's going to put me on my back and maybe pin me. So he catches my wrist off the gut wrench, and so pretty much I have to swim out and just bail um, off being on top of him. And he, he ends up reversing me. It's three to one. And this is all within the first, I think, fireworks like this is the first i think 30 or 40 seconds in the match so it's on and the americans ahead of him three to one and we got a match now and he knows i have a double egg and uh, so then the, now 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 we're really wrestling now so let's recap slay hit a double egg and a gut wrench to take a 3-0 lead but then satia reversed them to make it three to one at this point brandon's high school coach johnny cobb was waving the american flag so fast that his wrist was about to fall off. Yeah, I, I think he just stunned him. I think it took set of it just a bit to get back in it. Yeah. You I know, agree, I, 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 mentally, I think he's going, who have I got? Because I, I thought he was just this American that everybody wanted that they could have an easy match with. By this point, everyone in the arena had eyes on this match. And what they saw was Satiev losing 3-1. to one. But as the match crossed into the second minute, the Russian spotted an opening, hit a single leg, and scored a point, making it 3-2 to two, Slay. Back on their feet, Satiev continued to press forward until Slay hit another shot, but Satiev countered, and now Brandon was in a dogfight on the mat with the best scrambler in the world. I forced a shot and end up he ended up turning into a single leg, which again, based on all my film study, I do not want to be on a single leg on him. I'm in on a single leg. I'm holding on. Saitiev, very astute at counters. I saw him at the Goodwill Games in New York City in 1998, and he took everybody down that shot on his legs. And there's short time left. I remember there's short time. I couldn't see the clock, but looking back on it, it was just a dumb thing for me to do to let go. I let go with literally one second left in the first period. It was like, let's say the first period was three minutes. It was like 257, 258, and my hands go, boop, 259, and he scores. Yeah. So it was three to two. He scores a point with one second left. Satiev's counter was beautiful. 
one that required flexibility, vision, and confidence. And at the end of that first period, at the halfway mark of the match, the score was knotted 3-3. Three three. Satiev walked to his left to see Dimitri, while Slay staggered to his corner and put his hands on his head. But now we're going in the second period. He knows I can attack him. He knows I can take him down. I know that I don't need to shoot any single legs on him anymore. Thankfully, that mad adjustment was kind of clear to me. Bruce Burnett and Kevin Jackson made that real clear. No singles, only doubles. After the break, both wrestlers returned to the center mat, which is three minutes remaining in the bout. I think what <clears throat> what unfolded in that match, you know, as Satiev came back and tied it, you know, and Brandon had some matches early in his college career where he had big leads and he, you know, either struggled to maintain them or lost his lead, you know, and, and was kind of a, you know, went out and hit hard early. Um, you know, it's like, can he maintain this as Satiev is coming on here? That was Roger Reyna. He was in the stands too, watching as Slay hung on to the 3-3 three to three tie. You see him steadily moving forward, small steps, Slay giving ground. He may draw another passive call if he's not careful. And I would, I'll be really honest, I started getting labored. He's digging underhooks, he's starting to put the pressure on. One time he goes to kick, you know, my foot. He almost knocks me off balance, I have to run away from it. I was starting to feel tired. Conditioning will be a factor at this point. The Russian's not known for their conditioning, except unfortunately uh, for this guy. He's always been in very good shape. With just 60 seconds left in the match, it was still tied 3-3. Three to three. Satiev hit an elbow pass to a high crotch, but then Slay countered. Oh, his head's down. Slay has an opportunity. Saitiev, though, countering well, steps over the top again. Tremendous flexibility by the Russian. Able to stop what apparently looked like a good attack by the American Slay. And then we get to about maybe 15 seconds left. I think both of us realize, like, okay, it's 3-3. Let's not take a bad shot. Let's, okay, let's, let's do this in overtime. Well, they're going to let the cock run out in regulation time, and this will go to overtime. The first wrestler to score, sudden death, sudden victory, whatever you want to call it. There's Mima covering her eyes. She doesn't want to see him lose, but maybe he can pull this one out. As the overtime began, Satiev edged forward, dangerously upright in his stance, while Slay pawed at Satiev's head. With just 25 seconds gone, the two finally locked up. I'm wrestling in there with him. He's going to dig underhook. We're really close together, and all of a sudden, I feel him rise up. And right when I felt that, I just didn't think. I just, instinct. Slay's had some good opportunities to score, but the ability to counter by Saitiev has been phenomenal. That is what has led him. That's going to do it. There it is. That's going to do it. Oh, my goodness. What a upset victory this will be for Brandon Slay. goodness his father Doug also celebrating it almost looked like he was wearing down a little bit Jeff but he exploded in that overtime to beat the reigning Olympic champion he will advance out of the pool Meemaw crying the entire arena was in pandemonium Johnny Cobb was standing on his seat Woo, it's been a ride for Coach Cobb. I'm going, what? What did we just see? <laughs> you know? Wow. Literally what we just saw was the greatest Olympic wrestling upset ever. That's what we saw. Back on the mat, Slay ran and jumped into KJ's arms. You know, that was a priceless moment that you'll never be able to recreate. Right. Takedown in overtime, sudden victory. Clear takedown, no subjectivity, totally behind him. KJ sprinting towards, you know, me, me jumping, you know, him jumping. It's like, uh, that was exciting. As Brandon walked off the platform, a reporter caught up to him. This is my first time at the Olympic Games, and to beat the defending Olympic champ early, that gives me the confidence to know that I can win there all the rest of these matches and become an Olympic champion myself. After that interview, Slay walked back through the tunnel and into the warm-up area when he saw Kevin Jackson. His coach, who looked like he had just seen a ghost. And then I'm back in the back. I'm excited about beating him. And then Kevin Jackson comes and says, Hey, Brandon, I know that you're excited, but you need to listen close to me. I'm like, what? 
They protested your match. You might have to go out there and wrestle him again. So I need to get your, I need you to get yourself mentally ready to go beat him again. And you're like, what? I know what you're thinking. This sounds ludicrous. But back in the early 2000s, a match could be protested for just $500. Which meant that now, a whole new set of refs would watch the match behind closed doors and rescore the bout. Now if those refs felt that the score should be different, they would order that the original match be re-wrestled. So I really, it wasn't like, hey, Brandon, you might have to wrestle him. I actually thought, I'm, this is probably going to happen. I just beat Satiev. I'm probably going to have to go wrestle him again. They're not going to want... Russia's not going to lose another of their stars again in the Olympics. So I actually thought I was going to have to do it. As the protest went on behind closed doors, 10 minutes passed, 20 minutes passed, and then finally 45 minutes passed until the officials were ready to announce their decision. Slay and Satiev stood motionless as the officials left the protest room. Kevin thankfully comes in and says, he's like, he's like, hey, you won the protest, right? You beat him. And I was like, I was like, oh, thank God. Right. So then we could get excited about it. And then it was, it was real. Finally, Brandon Slee had his win over the great Bovisar Satiev. And one of the most epic matches of all time, Slay had taken out the Russian, handing him his first loss in nearly five years. Inside the arena, one of Brandon's friends called Clint Motter, who was back in Manhattan. I remember Josh calling me. It was He woke me up. At, the stuff wasn't on TV at that time, so but he woke me up at about 1 o'clock in the morning, and he's just I could just hear the background, you know, the roar of the crowd, and all I heard is Josh yelling, Slay beat Satiev, Slay beat Satiev. And yeah, that was that was like in the arena at the moment. And I was just like, I, you know, I didn't go back to sleep. I was so excited. So Clint wasn't the only one. As later that night, back at the hotel, Brandon's dad, Doug, laid in bed, wide awake. I couldn't even sleep at night. God, I was all night laying there. I'd walk, get up and walk. And I'd go outside the motel room. And I'd just sit out there and I'd say, jeez, cannot believe it happened. I beat myself again and said, can I? I mean, Satya was that good. He was that good. Back in the Olympic Village, Bovasar sat in his dorm room, speechless. When I lost at the 2000 Olympics, it was quite a shock. During the first night, yes, it was a little uncomfortable. I couldn't believe that this happened to me. But on the second day, Adam was already wrestling in the morning and I changed my attention to him. I don't think losing this match was a tragedy or something bad for me. I never worry about things that cannot be fixed. My philosophy was that a wrestler should not be overwhelmed by the result. In the process of becoming a wrestler, you already come to the point that you don't give over importance to medals, to titles. We must forget all of these and go ahead. The craziest part about this whole story is that Brandon still had three matches left if he wanted to win that gold medal. And folks, what happened after this match might be even crazier than the upset itself. So join me in episode five as we explore life after the upset for both Slay and Satya. From Wrestling Changed My Life, this is Slang Satiev. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please leave a review and tell your friends about this episode. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app you can think of. If you're listening on your smartphone, tap or swipe on the cover art of this podcast. You'll find episode show notes and offers from our sponsor, Spartan Combat. Please support our show by supporting them at SpartanCombat.com. Slang Satiev was written, edited, and produced by me, Ryan Warner. Story consulting by Raleigh Peterkin. Custom music by Gary Lanelli. Assistant producer Lake Waters. And business manager Tanner Warner. Without you folks, this episode would not be possible, so thank you. And last but not least, a huge thank you to Brandon Slay and everyone who participated in this story. Slang Sativa was produced by Wrestling Changed My Life, 
For all information about this series, please go to WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Peace!